Hello and good morning. Welcome to Shiloh Worship Online. My name is Teresa Works. I'm the Modern Worship Coordinator here at Shiloh, and I want to welcome you to our service today. Feel free to like, share, and comment on this so that we can share the love of Jesus to everybody who comes into contact with this video because, you know, we at Shiloh just love to love on God. And what's really exciting about this week is that this is the first week of Advent, and our I guess you want to say theme is on hope and I don't know anybody in this world who can live without hope and so yes go ahead and share it enjoy it and uh, we will focus on uh, our king our hope in Jesus so with that being said I'm gonna go ahead and open us up in prayer and then we're just gonna get started in worship this morning Heavenly Father we just thank you for today we thank you for this opportunity that we get to share in worship with you, God, with others who can't even be here with us, but we're just so thankful. We're so grateful for this opportunity. God, we want to worship you this morning, and we want to put all of our hope and our trust in you. Help us to do that today, that in the, you are the light and the darkness. You are our strength and our hope, our hope, our hope. We love you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today's epistle lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Now hear the lesson. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by him. You were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy word. thank God for your giving and stewardship of all that you've been given. Let's pray together. 
Merciful God, sometimes we become distracted and even weary in our work with you. We keep busy schedules, we rush about, we think of all that there's left to do, and we don't rest. We're captivated by technology. We're seduced by the lure of consumer goods. So much so that we do not remain alert to your divine presence. But you are here in our church, in the world, in our community, in our lives. Make us to be better doorkeepers, watching for you attentively, opening the door for you. Awaken us to the surprising power and glory of your presence. Be gracious toward us and help us to be gracious toward others, to welcome all so that we are at home with you. We pray in the name of Christ, who was and is and is to come. Amen. This is the beginning of the Christian calendar. The Christian calendar begins with the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means to come, and we uh, anticipate the return of Christ, but also remember his first coming into the world. Now, the scripture is from the 64th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking to the people and it is uh, quite amazing what he says. And it's all about hope. These words. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. 
to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf. and Our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, You are the Father, and we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider. We are all your people. There is a malady that I will call homesickness of the soul. The worshiping community in Jerusalem is in dire circumstances. There are enemies in the land and the rebuilding of Jerusalem is not going well after the exiles have returned home from Babylon. They feel the absence of God. Here in the 64th chapter, Isaiah almost speaks for the priests in feeling the absence of God, wanting the intervention of God like in days before. They are homesick even though they're in the promised land. Have you ever experienced homesickness of the soul where you long for God And it just seems that God is a bit out of reach. It's a lot like just being homesick. Homesickness is no fun. When I was in college, I nearly despaired at being homesick. I had just gotten to Tulsa, Oklahoma, And it seemed so far away from Cincinnati. And I simply was lost. I didn't have any friends at the university. So I remember one time being alone in my dorm room. And I actually prayed like this. I said, oh God. Would you have a thousand angels point their fingers at my mother and tell her to call me? Now, when I look back on that prayer, I'm not sure that was a good idea. I mean, after all, angels um, shouldn't take time out of their busy schedule to fix my homesickness. 
But homesickness is difficult. Perhaps you've felt some homesickness this past week as we dealt with the pandemic and Thanksgiving at the same time. At any rate, one minute after I made that call or made that prayer, I received a call from my mother. Here, in this passage, Isaiah says, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. This is probably the voice of the priests, feeling God is removed from them. That God has not visited them in their distress that the rebuilding of the temple and so forth is not going well. They want supernatural action. God should act like God did during the Exodus. The mountains should quake. The pillar of fire should be unmistakable. Like God should appear like the burning bush or water that causes, uh, is caused to boil by a pot uh, uh, over a flame. They want God to be obvious. So even the enemies take notice. They are hoping for intervention. But the preacher says to wait for God. That God works for those who wait for him. Now you could argue that waiting for God is synonymous with hope. Hope. And you may not merely have to wait for a minute for God to answer. Sometimes we have to wait for hours or days, weeks or months or years. Some people wait for nearly all the time they have left in the world. But this text, in the midst of such desolation, brings hope. The prophet is basically saying that we have some things to unlearn. That when we learn something, it's almost more difficult than, or when we un, yeah, when we are trying to learn something, unlearning it is almost more difficult. Once we learn something, even if it's wrong, we have trouble updating ourselves to the truth. That's why we need prophets. Prophets confront things that need to be unlearned. And that's why Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He's saying, you may have thought this about God, but I'm God, and this is how God really is. We have to unlearn. And when we can unlearn some things, well, hope often appears. There's a story about a person who comes to a wise, a spiritual teacher and asks to be taught how to have greater faith and hope. The spiritual master offers his guests some tea and he pours the tea into the cup for the guests. 
the, the mentor for the mentee. But the master, the spiritual master, keeps pouring the tea. And it just finally overflows the cup. But he doesn't stop. He keeps pouring the tea till it is overflowing more and more and more. And the one who is the student can stand it no more and says, Master, you are wasting the tea. The cup is full. Do not keep pouring. No more will go in. The wise spiritual teacher replied, Like this cup, you are full of your own opinions and speculation. How can I teach you to grow in faith and hope unless you first empty your cup. And so Isaiah wants us to empty our cup of some things. And the first thing is that hope is not built on innocence. We like to think if I can just be pure, if, if I cannot sin, if I can do exactly what's right, then uh, all will go well. It says in this passage, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid your eyes from us. We transgressed. We've all become like one who's unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf. Don't be exceedingly angry with us, God. This is in juxtaposition to what was said earlier. You meet those who gladly do right and those who remember you in your ways. So which is it? Are we sinners? Or does God only meet those who gladly do right? The implication is uh, clear that hope cannot be tied to our innocence if it is we don't have a chance. If we become convinced of our own innocence, we will likely just blame enemies. And even ultimately, we will blame God. In fact, that's here in our text. It says that we sin because, well, you hid yourself, God. It's your fault. If you hadn't hid yourself, we'd be fine. If you kept doing miracles, 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 we'd all be good. Just do and act like you did when you led the people out of Israel. We need 10 plagues. We need to meet you on the mountain. But then Isaiah reminds them, but while Moses was on the mountain, they sinned in the valley. Our hope is not built on innocence. It's built on who God is. So, you remember that hymn, My Hope is Built? Hmm. It doesn't say, My Hope is Built on nothing less than my own innocence. It doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> it says my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
It's on God that hope is built. We've got to unlearn that our innocence forces God to do something. Hope is built on the faithfulness of God. The prophet concludes, Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. God, you're in charge. You're the one who molds things. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Don't be exceedingly angry, O Lord. Don't remember our iniquity forever. So, God is the faithful one. Now, there's something else that we've got to unlearn. And it's contained in the very last verse here. Now consider, we are all your people. All your people. We have to be free of this obsession of our own innocence. Cling to the faithfulness of God for hope. But we also have to begin to see our connection to all people. Too many people want to build their innocence upon the guilt of someone else. And it doesn't work. We must unlearn this falsehood that claims I am good because she or he is worse than I am. We must learn we are all God's people. Hope is God's gift of oneness. One spiritual writer says this, when no one is a stranger. The whole world is our home. When no one is a stranger, the whole world is our home. It doesn't matter where we're at. God is there. And we have friends wherever we go. The good news of hope is realized when we know we're connected to the God who loves us and that we are all God's people. Amen.
As we go out to meet a hungry world, know that God will give us what we need. We go forth to make ready as we wait. The Holy One, whose love turns fear aside, will show us what to do. Keep watch. The risen Christ is on the way. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.